Welcome to this online training on Library Board Basics. I'm Roger Carswell, the director of the Southeast Kansas Library System. Although many parts of this training, especially when we talk about the board director relationship, are relevant to most public libraries, much of the rest of the content is based on Kansas law. I say this because once you put something on the web, you never know who might be using it. So that's my disclaimer. If you're not from Kansas, you won't find this very useful. In Kansas, libraries may be organized in several ways, including a city, county, township, and district libraries. This presentation focuses on city, county, and township libraries. District libraries have a few things that are different about choosing board members, their terms, and budgeting, so it seemed best to do that as a separate webinar. First, let's talk about membership. City and township libraries have boards consisting of seven members, while county libraries have five member boards. In both cases, the law states that board members are appointed by the head of the municipality with the approval of the governing body. That's kind of legal language, so let's translate that. For city libraries, it means the mayor makes appointments subject to approval by the city council or city commission. For township libraries, the township trustee makes the appointment which is approved by the Township Board. And for county libraries, the appointment is made by the chairperson with the approval of the full county commission. On this side, for simplicity, everything is shown as if the library is a city library, as the vast majority of our SEK libraries are. But in what I'll say, I'll also address county and township libraries. Members of the library board must be residents of the municipality. So, for city libraries, that means they have to live within the city limits, or within the township or county for township and county libraries. Now, the things I've said about board membership are what's in the law, but cities and counties in Kansas have home rule authority, meaning that for certain portions of the law, they can elect to exempt themselves from the law and put something different in its place. The Attorney General issued an opinion that library board law is subject to home rule, so a few cities have used home rule to change the rules, so to speak, when it comes to library board membership in their community. If your library is not in step with the way I've outlined board membership here, make sure that your community does have a charter ordinance in place which allows the change. The head of the municipality is also an ex officio member. This means the mayor, township trustee, or chairperson of the county commission. Although ex officio members, in other contexts, often are non-voting, that's not what ex officio means. Ex officio means by virtue of their office. Since the law states that they have all the powers and duties of the appointed members of the board, that also means they can vote. Other officials of the municipality can't be on the library board. Examples might be city council people, city treasurer, or city clerk. Board membership is an unpaid position, although they can be reimbursed expenses. And here's something which comes up pretty often in smaller libraries. Board members can't be paid for working at the library apart from their board role either. There's a legal doctrine called incompatibility of office, which holds that it's incompatible to be an employee of a board that you're a member of. When a board member is paid, they become an employee of the board. So, board members may volunteer at the library, but they cannot be paid. Moving on to terms of board members. All terms are for four years and all expire on April 30th. Members can be appointed to two consecutive terms. After serving two terms, they must go off the board for at least one year, but after that, they can be appointed again. When there are vacancies on the board, the person appointed to fill the vacancy can serve out the remainder of that term and then is eligible for two full terms of their own. Notice what I said about someone who is appointed to a vacancy filling out the remainder of that term. This means that libraries never get off the cycle of one or two board terms expiring annually and always on April 30th. Sometimes we hear something like, we have three board members whose terms are up this year, or Mary's term expired in January. Actually, no, those things can't be true. A board with seven members will have three years where two terms expire and then one year where there's only one term that does. And that four-year cycle will keep going on forever. 
so there will never be more than two members whose terms expire in the same year. I think the way these mistakes crop up is when there's a vacancy and people assume that the person appointed serves four years from the date of appointment, but that's not the way it is. If your library has somehow gotten off cycle, what I recommend if you can't figure out who should be serving terms until when is that the board comes to an agreement about which terms will expire April 30th of each of the next four years. One way that I'd recommend is to take the two most recent appointments and have them expire in the fourth year and then work on back. Then make sure you stay on that schedule from there on out. The board sets a regular monthly meeting date and location. Special meetings can be called by the chair or if the majority of the members request one, the chair has to call a special meeting. For special meetings, there must be at least two days notice in writing to each member of the board, and this has to state the purpose of the special meeting. At the special meeting, the only business can be what's stated in the notice. The board's bylaws should identify when election of officers will be held. Most often, that's the May meeting, and that makes sense because that's the first meeting after the new terms begin. The law specifies electing a chair, a secretary, a treasurer, and such other officers as they may deem necessary. One thing I want to be sure and point out is that when election of officers is done, the board should also designate who's going to be the library's representative to the board of the Southeast Kansas Library System. That can be the board president, another board member, or whoever the board chooses. One of the primary responsibilities of the board is, in cooperation with the library director, to develop a plan for library services. You should know what you want the library to be doing. You can call this a strategic plan or a long-range plan or whatever, but get a plan down in writing and use it as a guidepost. Then the board has the duty of setting the budget for the library. You may say, oh, doesn't the city do that? No, the board does that and the city must levy the amount necessary to fund the budget within the limitations fixed by law. What you see in quotation marks here on the slide is taken directly from the law, that the tax that is levied is to be in such sum as the library board shall determine within the limitations fixed by law. The key is what are those limitations? The city can pass a charter ordinance setting a maximum mill levy. But if there's no charter ordinance, the city must levy the amount necessary to fund the budget adopted by the library board. And if there is a charter ordinance, they still have to levy the amount as long as it doesn't go over the cap. This could turn into a whole long discussion of budgeting, but that's a separate topic in itself and not within the scope of this webinar, so we'll leave that for another day. But for now, let's just leave it as noting that it's a duty of the library board to adopt a budget for the library. This budget should be based on the plan the board has developed. A related duty is to secure the funding to support the budget. If the budget you set will require additional funding, the board should work to secure that. This is part of advocacy for the library. This may mean working with local government to raise whatever mill levy limitation may be in place, or just making sure that the local government fulfills its legal obligation to levy the amount necessary to fund the budget. It may also mean fundraising. Another duty is to adopt policies for the library. In Kansas, library boards are policy-making boards. They're not just advisory boards. The library board actually sets policy on services, personnel, and anything else having to do with the library. The city doesn't do that. The board does. The board also has the power to hire and fire the library director and fix the director's compensation meaning salary and benefits. The board has the power of leasing or erecting a building for the library. Another duty of boards given in the law is to make annual reports to the state librarian and the governing body of the municipality. The law says this should include receipts and disbursements, statistical information, library services available, and other information as the city council may require. A final duty I want to note is to make the library free to the use of the residents of the municipality. The law requires free library service, which is usually interpreted to mean, at the least, using materials and equipment in the library and checking out materials. 
This doesn't mean that there can't be charges for some add-on services, such as photocopying. And the state regulations regarding regional library systems also require that if your library belongs to the regional library system, you must extend this free service to all residents of the region. Now let's start taking a look at the roles of library boards and library directors. First up in the area of budget and finance. Boards and library directors work together to develop the budget, but as noted before, boards have the responsibility of adopting a budget. Then administering the budget falls to the director. By this, I mean that within the constraints of the budget, the director is given authority to make expenditures without additional board authorization except for perhaps a policy that orders for a single item with a cost exceeding X dollars should be brought to the board. $2,000 might be a good breaking point for this, for instance. Then both the board and the director should review regular financial reports to see how the library is doing compared to what was budgeted for both revenues and expenditures. On to policies and procedures. As I've already said, Boards have the responsibility of adopting policies for the library. However, this shouldn't be done in a vacuum. A good situation is one where the director feels free to bring recommendations on policy matters to the board, and the board and director work together to develop the policy before adoption. Once adopted, it's up to the director to implement the most suitable procedures to carry out the policy. Collection development. As part of its policy-making power, the board should have in place a material selection or collection development policy, and as part of its budget-setting authority, there is a set amount for expenditures on library materials, such as books and DVDs. The duty of selecting which materials to purchase and then ordering them is the library directors, or in larger libraries, other staff members to whom the director delegates this duty boards should not be making decisions about which books to purchase or which magazines to subscribe to. And finally, on personnel matters, the board hires the library director, evaluates the director, and if necessary, dismisses the director. The director, in turn, is responsible for hiring, evaluating, and if necessary, firing other staff members. This completes the topics I wanted to address in this session. I strongly encourage you, if you're a library board watching this as a group, to discuss the content among yourselves. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact either me or Kim Rudder, our library system consultant, to answer questions or to carry on a discussion. Our contact information is on this last slide. If you are a Southeast Kansas library board watching this as a group, you should make a record of which members watch this training and on what date, so you can report that on next January's allocation worksheet. Thanks for watching this training.